A couple of weeks ago, I was reading a book, and I generally enjoy reading, um, but sometimes I read a book, and you finish a book, and it's like, eh, that's, that was okay. Every once in a while, I'm reading a book, and I read something, and it literally catches me so off guard, it takes my breath away. That, that, that I'll be reading something, and instead of just turning to the next page, I, I have to put the book down and be like, I need to think about that. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I, I read a quote that did just that. It's from a pastor leader uh, named Neil Cole, and he wrote this. Ultimately, each church will be evaluated by only one thing, its disciples. Your church is as only as good as its disciples. It does not matter how good your praise, which was beautiful this morning, preaching, which I hope will be okay this morning, <laughs> programs or property are. If your disciples are passive, needy, consumerist, and not moving in the direction of radical obedience, your church is not good. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, you, I, I put that down. I actually take, took a picture of it, sent it to, I was on a thread with a ton of other lead pastor friends, sent it to all them, and they all were like, thanks for ruining my Monday. <laughs> it felt, it feels like that. It's like, whoa, this is weighty. Like, it's so easy to think about other things. Like, hey, how is kids' ministry? How's the lawn looking out there? You like, Jesus, you like our stained glass? He goes, one thing, your disciples, are, are they following me? Do they love me? Do they obey me? Do they enjoy me? That's what he's judging our church on. I will stand before him as one of the leaders in this church, and he will evaluate restored L.A., not based on all these other things that are fun and easy to think about, but on the health of our disciples and the process of our disciple-making. Today we conclude our sermon series, The Jesus Way. For the last two months, we've been looking at what does it mean to be a disciple. And if you're brand new, disciple is a weird word that maybe you're not sure of. It just means a learner. It means a follower. It means an apprentice. So when we say a disciple of Jesus, it means you're an apprentice of Jesus, that you follow him. And so for the past two months, we've been looking at different things, saying if we're followers of Jesus, it means, newsflash, we follow Jesus. We actually do the things he did. We don't just like read about them, we do them. And so for us, we've been looking at different things. We've looked at preaching the kingdom of God like Jesus, serving and loving people like Jesus, healing the sick like Jesus, casting out demons like Jesus, um, l having meals with people like Jesus, bringing peace and division like Jesus, all of these things. And today is going to kind of be like a meta sermon where we step back and go, now not only are you called to do all those things, you're called and invited to helping others do those same things. Jesus does not just say, hey, I want you to do this stuff. He says, I want you to do this stuff, and I want you to help other people do this alongside you. Th this is what it's all about. So for us today, as we finish this series, we're gonna, we've been asking every week, what did Jesus do? And you could almost define his whole ministry under this phrase, he made disciples. He made disciples and he developed leaders, and now we, as disciples, get to join him in that work. So if you have a Bible, run over to Matthew chapter four. I want you just to see just a glimpse. The whole, the whole gospels of Jesus make, is making disciples. You can't just be like, oh, here's a glimpse of Jesus making disciples. That's all he's doing throughout the whole gospels. It's very rare that he's by himself. He's nearly always with people and he's making disciples as he does it. We're going to look at just one passage where he called the disciples to himself and kind of what some of this looks like here as we get an understanding of what Jesus did as he made disciples. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. <clears throat> as Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. 
follow me, Jesus told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. So, so real, real quick pause. He calls these two disciples, they're fishermen, they're fishing, and he goes, hey you, come and follow me instead. I'll make you fishers of men. You're fishing for fish right now. You're catching fish. I want you to come with me and we'll catch people together. This is Jesus' invitation to life in his kingdom. He does not say, hey, follow me and I'll make you a little bit better of a version that you are currently. He says, follow me and we'll transform the world together. Follow me and I I will make you, I will change you first into the person that I, Jesus, am, because Jesus is a fisher of people. He goes, I'll make you do the same thing. And they drop their nets and they immediately follow. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, preparing their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now Jesus began to go all over Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news to the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Then the news about him spread throughout Syria, so they brought to him all those who were afflicted, those suffering from various diseases and intense pains, the demon-possessed, the epileptics, and the paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. Jesus, uh, our best guess is that around 30 years old is when he began his public ministry. 30, 31, 29, 20, whatever, somewhere in there. And it was about three years of public ministry. We know very little about Jesus' life from birth to 30, which is shocking. I talk to a lot of young 20-year-olds. They're like, I gotta change the world. I'm like, Jesus didn't start till he was 30, so relax for a few. (laughs) He's the son of God, and he doesn't make an Instagram account until he's 30. He, He doesn't go public until he's 30, and then he's only there for about three years. And please hear me, in three years, he changed the entire world. Now at the end of the three years, the entire world wasn't changed, but, but it gradually began changing because of his work for three years. That 2,000 years later, we're here in a building in Los Angeles speaking English, worshiping him. Amen. We have two brothers from South Africa, Eugene who is playing for us today, They're worshiping Jesus in Durban, South Africa. Maria's in with us from India this morning. The nations worship Jesus. Now, now, how did he do it? If, If you were given, I come to you and I go, hey, you have three years to change the world. What's your game plan? I bet you would need, think of a few things. One, We need money. Like I need some billionaire angel investors to help out. Two, I need political power. If I could could get in maybe at the UN and kind of pitch my view and my desire and my dream with the global leaders, that would help. And then we need a sick marketing team. We gotta get this word out. Billboards, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, everything. That's how I would begin to get the word out. That's how I would begin to change the world with my message. Jesus was poor, a homeless wanderer, zero political power, and he lived before Instagram. Jesus knew he would change the world His game plan was this. Hey, you guys, let's hang out. You too, join. You guys, yeah, come on, let's hang out. It's like, are you gonna change the world? He's like, oh yeah, this is how I'm gonna do it. It seems really normal. We're just eating food and hanging out. He's like, yeah, 
that this is how I'm going to change the world is by investing in disciples who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples. Fast forward 2,000 years later, you and I are here. That's his game plan. It may not sound very sexy, it may not sound very cool, but after Jesus rose from the dead, the beginning of Acts says there were about 120 followers. Friends, that's about how many people are in this room. We might have a few more. And Jesus goes, 120? Yeah, that's enough to change the world. We look at a room like this, we go, ah, there's some empty seats over here. Ah, what? we need more. Jesus is like, no, this is plenty. This, with my spirit, this is, this is all we need to literally transform the world. This is the invitation Jesus offers you and I. Do you want to follow him and become like him and help others do the same? Yes. Amen. Susie does. What about the rest of you? So how did he do it? What, if we're going to do it in 2023, remember that Dallas Willard quote, discipleship is me living my life as if Jesus were me. Like if Jesus were me, how would he live as Brad Sarian, 2023, in the valley, a dad, husband, like, what would Jesus look like if he were that? And for you, it looks different. But, but let's first look at how, how did he make disciples. Um, Jeff Vanderstelt, uh, he is a pastor, leader of a uh, global church planting crew called Soma. And he says, and I think it's super helpful, he says, Jesus made disciples in three primary ways. He made disciples life on life, life in community, and life on mission. If you want to make disciples, you have to understand these three things because this is how Jesus made disciples. And if we're going to follow Jesus, become like him, we have to do the same thing. So life on life, what does that mean? When Jesus made disciples, he says, Peter and James, come here. He doesn't say, Peter and James, go over there. They spent a lot of time together. It was life on life. I mean, there, there were nights where they're probably out in the open fields where they didn't have a place to sleep and they're just sleeping out in the open field. Like Jesus didn't have the private suite and then his disciples outside. He's shoulder to shoulder with his disciples. There, there was no space for there to be secrets. They, they did life together. Like, like, you know how when you meet someone, they're always amazing at first? And then like three days later, you're like, whoa, you've got issues. <laughs> like it, take, it takes some of that rubbing shoulders to realize, oh, you're not perfect. It's life on life that exposes that. It's when I see you, not just on the convenience times of like, hey, when do you want to meet up? It's like when somebody walks into your home and they're like, hey, whoa, what are you doing here? It's like there's, there's, there's little boundaries for Jesus. He is up close and personal with his disciples. He does not keep them at arm's length. He goes, you want to become like me? You're not going to become like me over there. You'll become like me right here. Life on life. Life in community. Rarely will you see Jesus making disciples one-on-one. -on -one. It's oftentimes in the American church how we view discipleship. It's like, oh, you want to, I'll, I'll disciple you. Let's read through this book together. We'll get coffee once a week and we'll talk about each chapter. Now again, I'm not opposed to that. I sometimes do that. It's not bad. It's just not the fullness of what discipleship is. We know it's not the fullness of discipleship. Here's why. Because Jesus never did that. Jesus never was like, hey, I wrote this good book. I'll see you next week. Have a good one. We'll talk about it. Do you also know that one-on-one -on -one you can impress somebody pretty easily? Like, like, like you just go out to dinner? Like so I, you just talk for like an hour and a half. Just ask them a lot of questions. I'll be like, wow, they're a remarkable person. <laughs> Bring other people to that dinner. The guy who forgot his wallet again. The, the, the gal that doesn't stop talking. And now let's see how well he does community begins to expose our ugliness. When I'm by myself, I'm amazing. 
when my kids walk in the room, dad, 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 dad. It's like, oh. (laughs) And I can blame it on them, but really they're exposing what was already in here. This is why we, we encourage those of you guys and gals dating, date in community. I met the perfect guy. Oh my gosh, he's amazing. He's like, how does he do with other people? I don't know. One on one, he's, he's incredible. Get, get them around other people. This is where discipleship opportunities come up over and over and over. One of my favorite ones is in Matthew 20. Jesus is walking on a road. And all of a sudden, he overhears the disciples arguing about which one of them is the greatest. Does that happen with one-on-one discipleship with Jesus? That is not, Peter is not sitting one-on-one at a coffee table with Jesus going, I think I'm greater than you. But when Peter and James and John and the boys are all hanging out, they're like, who do you think's best? And Jesus is like, here we go. Jesus goes, discipleship time. Why are you guys arguing about who's greatest in the kingdom? You, you want to become great in the kingdom of God? Become a servant of all people. Do, do the opposite of what you're doing. This is how Jesus disciples. It's very organic. Jesus doesn't go, oh my gosh, we have to go through a book on service now. He sees the sin exposed and he goes, let's deal with it now. This is what community does. This is why I love community groups. Every, well, we just had our first week of community groups, this, uh, gospel communities this last week. Everyone loves week one. Everyone's so friendly, kind, it's beautiful. Week six, there's some people who are bothering other people. <laughs> it's like, if he's going, I'm not coming anymore. It's like, no, this is a discipleship opportunity. We, you can actually have a hard conversation. This stuff happens in community, okay? So we want to be a people who, life on life, life in community, and then life on mission. Jesus does not say, here's a book, go to my classroom. He says, come with me and we'll change the world. We have a mission we're on. Will you join me on that mission? We don't disciple just here. We're hanging out. We're waiting for heaven. We disciple on our way to expanding the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. That's how we make disciples. That's how Jesus made disciples. So how do we do it? What what are some practical ways for us in 2023? Um, If you have your Bible, run over to the right. Matthew 28, kind of the chief passage on discipleship and the nations and God's heart to see the kingdom expand everywhere. This is after, this is at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. It's after he has died on the cross for our sins. It's after he rose from the dead victoriously. He's hung out with his disciples for a few weeks, preaching and proclaiming the kingdom of God to them. And now he's about to ascend into heaven. But before he ascends, he gives them this commission. Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That's like if you underline or highlight stuff, that's a really good one to underline. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe Everything I have commanded you, and remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Okay, as I talk about discipleship, hey, we're called to make disciples. I think there's a tendency for some of us in this room to be like, no, no, I can't make disciples. I'm not a varsity Christian yet. I haven't been to seminary. Brad, I'm kind of new here. I've only been here a couple years. This is, this disciple making, that's for like the leaders, right? This passage says, this is for every follower of Jesus. Here's how. Did Jesus command you and I through this passage to make disciples of all nations? Yes and no. He's he's clearly talking to the 11 disciples at that time. But if you follow the logic of what he's saying, he's telling the 11 disciples, you 11, go, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, 
teaching them to observe everything I commanded you. What is one of the commands Jesus commanded them? Go make disciples. So some people are like, well, the original disciples were commanded to make disciples, but I just sit on a couch and hang all day. No, the original disciples were commanded to make disciples, and if they made healthy disciples, those disciples continued to make more disciples. That, newsflash, that's why we're here. Faithful brothers and sisters for 2,000 years have made disciples. That's why we're sitting here, which is remarkable. You and I are invited into this process of making disciples if you're a follower of Jesus. So, just like last week though, before we get to a couple practicals, there is one major prerequisite that we need to handle before we move to the practicals. The prerequisite is like, before you get here, you have to handle this. Here's what it is. If you want to make disciples, you first have to be a disciple of Jesus and you should be living a life worthy of imitation. That's where it gets a little scary. Okay, I'll I'll make disciples. You will replicate what you are. This is why parenting's terrifying. I was talking to a guy yesterday, he was like, I don't know if I want to have kids because the kids are just gonna become like me. I'm like, yeah, for better and for worse. The beautiful stuff we, we, we love, the bad stuff we blame on the other parent. Your disciples will become like you. Are, are we following Jesus and is our life worthy of imitation? Are, we have to be filled with the Spirit of God to be led by the Spirit of God. In John 20, 21, Jesus tells his disciples, as the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. In the very next verse it says, then he breathed on them the Holy Spirit. He doesn't go, hey guys, I'm sending you out. Good luck. He goes, I'm sending you out, but you desperately need the Spirit of God. And he imparts the Spirit to them and says, go. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, I think it's one of the most helpful passages on practical discipleship. The New International Version says it this way. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to the church at Corinth. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. That's discipleship. Paul's going, I'm following Jesus. You all follow me as I follow him. I think many of us in this room would be uncomfortable saying that. I think many of us in this room think it would almost be prideful or arrogant to say, I can't, I, Brad, I can't tell anyone to follow me like I'm following Jesus. That's just, that's like, you can't tell people that. It's 2023. No, no you, you can. And if you're a Christian, you should. Now, is anyone in this room perfect? No. So am I saying, follow me as I perfectly follow Jesus? No. I'm saying, follow me as I follow Jesus, and when I fail to follow Jesus, follow me as I repent and then turn back and then continue to follow Jesus. Last sermon, uh, in the first service, uh, Jared LaRue, he felt like he got a word that, that's, um, that many of us feel unworthy to even begin to invite people to follow us as we're following Christ. I think it's spot on. I think many of us do feel unworthy. We're like, well, what if I mess up? What if I'm not fully there? Friends, here's what this looks like in my life. A couple things. Um, Nadia, who preached a few weeks ago, when, after she became a Christian, she moved into our home. She needed a place to, to stay. We began discipling her. Now, now, we never signed a formal agreement. I will be your discipler. Please sign here. It's just that we're doing life together and we're following Jesus. And so there's a follow Jesus as we follow him. Follow us as we follow Jesus. Um, When I fail to love my wife well or my kids well, right? If there is a situation where I speak unkindly to my wife or my kids, which happens? I know. You guys are all perfect. Judge me you want. (laughs) 
I, when Nadia is present, and if I'm unkind with my wife and kids, I don't go, Nadia, take notes. That's how you disciple your family. I get some time with Jesus and repent, and then come back to the living room and apologize publicly to my wife and my kids and to Nadia and go, I'm sorry you were here to witness me not loving my wife and my kids. Will you forgive me? I was not following Jesus well. Now, what am I doing in that moment? I'm discipling her. I'm discipling her even through my failures. I'm showing her, hey, you're gonna mess up. Here's what you do when you mess up. You apologize publicly, quickly, and without excuses. That's how you do it. Most people have never, ever seen a public apology in a family. They know I'm sorry. I bought dinner. It's like, I mean, I, I, I can't even go there. Um, we disciple through our failures. You don't disciple once you reach perfection. You're never going to reach perfection. You, you disciple, hey, follow me as I follow Christ. Well, what happens when I fail? Yeah, f- look what you do when you fail. This is what I did last Sunday. I hope you all are doing the digital detox. It's amazing. I know. Praise God. I won't ask. Don't raise your hands. But, but, but I didn't come up with that last Sunday. As like a, hmm, what does Restored LA need to grow in? You know what? I think they need to grow in not being as addicted to their phones as possible. Okay, I'm going to pitch this idea I have. No, no, no. If you remember last Sunday, I was like, guys, as I'm evaluating my listening to God, I think this is getting in the way. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to do a 30-day digital detox. Anyone want to join me? And three people went, yeah! (laughs) What am I doing? I'm following Jesus, and I'm going, I want to follow him. I want to know him intimately. He is everything to me. And this stupid thing's getting in the way. And if it's getting in the way for me, is it getting in the way for you? If so, let's get rid of it. Let's put some boundaries around it. I'm following him. Do you want to follow me as I follow him? What I could have done is like, oh man, I think I'm a little too addicted to my phone. Here's what I'll do. I'll come up with a plan for six months. I'll crush it. After six months, I'll come in and rebuke everyone for being too addicted to their phones. You should have been like me. I don't use this thing much. Instead, I'm like, I'm in the process with you all. I'm, 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 I've not reached perfection. I won't until I see his face. But if I'm a step ahead, I can say, come with me. Here's what I think this looks like. This is why I hate the question, hey, Brad, is it sinful to dot, dot, dot? Is it, is it sinful to watch 20 hours of Netflix each week? It's not in here. How about instead of asking, is it sinful? We go, do I want to replicate this behavior in my disciples? Would I be stoked if my disciples, maybe it's one, maybe it's 20, maybe it's 100. If my disciples spent 20 hours a week on Netflix? Who who cares if it's sinful? It's like, that doesn't seem like that's going to help them love Jesus. So I'm, I'm not just thinking about me. I'm thinking about my life. Does it imitate Jesus? Am I living a life worthy of the gospel? That's what we should be asking. And as we do that, we go, hey, follow me as I follow Christ. We should evaluate our life. Those three main things we say every week. What does it mean to be a disciple? It means to remain in his love, reflect his likeness, repeat his lifestyle. Evaluate yourself. Am I remaining in his love? When's the last time I just sat in his presence and enjoyed the fact that I'm a beloved child of the king? That that, that should be a daily thing, friends. Because how can I help someone else experience that if I'm not experiencing that daily? How, How am I reflecting his likeness? How how am I doing in loving and in my joy and in my patience and in my goodness? Where can I say to my friends, hey guys, I feel like I've grown quite a bit in this area. Follow me in this area. And then where do I need to go? Hey guys, I'm struggling right here. let's, Let's pursue this together. Would you help? You know what? I'm struggling with joy. You seem really joyful. Would you help me grow in that? 
This is that life in community discipleship. Because none of us are Jesus, we can all learn from each other. In our gospel communities, there is a leader in the room. But they're not the only one who talks. If, if so, they're failing. They should be asking questions, and one of the biggest successes of a gospel community is when the other brothers and sisters begin discipling each other. That it's not just about the one leader. Because here's the thing, I can disciple you, but if I disciple you for five years and I'm the only one who disciples you, guess who you're gonna become like? Me. You're gonna get my strengths, you're gonna get my weaknesses. But if you're discipled by five or six or seven other brothers and sisters in the church over years, guess who you'll become like? you become like him, Jesus, because he he dwells in his people and each person has a different gift and a different passion and different strengths and different weaknesses. So we must be certain that we ourselves are following him in order to help others follow him. So last few practical things. Matthew 28, the the main verb in the section we read is make disciples. That's what the whole section hinges on. But there's a fancy phrase called participles that they're adjectival verbs. So they're verbs that describe what the verb is like or to be like. And so make, make disciples is the main verb. And then Jesus helps us see how do I make disciples? He says three main things. Go baptize, teach. Okay, I want to make disciples. Jesus goes, you make disciples by going, you make disciples by baptizing, you make disciples by teaching. That's how you make disciples. Question number one, are you going? He said go into all the nations. Now, I don't believe that necessarily means that every single one of us needs to go to every single nation. but what I certainly believe it means is that we have a a kingdom mindset that is far bigger than our little neighborhood. For many of us, we think of Christianity as the valley, maybe a little Chatsworth. This this is where we make disciples, these four walls. She goes, no, 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 I want you to go to your coworkers. I want you to go to your neighbors. I want you to go to your friends and disciple them. I cannot settle as a church that is just focused on the little here and now. There are eight billion people in the world that Jesus loves dearly. It's it's why Eugene and Tabani are here with us from South Africa. It's why Maria is here with us from India. They're all gonna be at our Family of Churches retreat next weekend. We have a global story because Jesus commands it. Now, now one of the beautiful things is the nations are here in Los Angeles. You don't even have to get on an airplane. The nations are here. Do we just think about discipleship of like, who looks like me and enjoys hiking like I do? I'll disciple those people. Or is it, I will disciple anyone who wants Jesus. I don't care what they look like. I don't care what they think like. I don't care who they voted for. I will disciple them because Jesus loves them. The last song we're gonna sing in our musical worship today is a song Eugene wrote. Part of it's gonna be in English. Part of it's gonna be in Zulu. We do stuff like this intentionally to wake us up to the reality that God does not just speak English. For some of us, we, when we think about God, we're gonna sing a song in Zulu, God's not up there with Google Translate, like what are they doing down there? What, what are these words? He, he is a God of all nations. And so even though you might not understand them exactly, our King does, and it expands our minds when we sing in other languages. Are we going, are we baptizing? I know it's hot, just hang with me for another few minutes. I'm in a long sleeve and I'm running around. Are we baptizing? One of my deepest dreams for our church is that each one of you who is a follower of Jesus baptizes at least one person before you die. 
Baptism is not just for the elite. It, I, I love baptizing people, but I also love watching you guys baptize people. You, you baptize someone who you've helped follow Jesus. And you don't need to be a pastor. You don't need to be a leader. You don't, you don't have to have any title. It's someone you've helped put their faith in Jesus and they go, will you be in the water with me and dunk me? It's one of the most special moments ever. And I plead with, like, do you think about that? Is that a desire of yours if you're a Christian? Is it something you're like, man, I'd love to see that happen. It's not gonna happen by you sitting on the couch. It happens as we go. It happens as we proclaim. You have to know the gospel to speak it so that someone can understand it and follow him. So we go, we baptize, and we teach. We teach people to observe everything he's commanded. That's why you need to know the scriptures. How can we teach people to observe what he's commanded if we don't know what he's commanded? How, how can we teach people to obey his commands when we ourselves aren't following them, aren't even trying to follow them? Would it be our deepest desire to know him so intimately that when things break out in conversation, like, hey, who, which one of us is the greatest? We don't, we don't say it that way, but it may come down to Instagram followers or who's making the most money or something like that. And we go, huh, I think I've heard that before. And Jesus rebuked that. He said, if we want to be great, we're actually going to serve. We're going to become a servant of all. It's in those moments. See, I, I think one step of discipleship is that we begin to have a lot more one-on-one -on -one conversations of correction. And I know that's terrifying. And I don't ever want this church to feel like you walk in and everyone's like, I've got issues with you. It's like, that's awful. It should always come from a place of love and grace, okay? But if you're in a church where no one's ever correcting you, you're not loved. Unless you're perfect. You know who gets corrected the most in this church? I think it's because I'm loved so much. I got corrected twice after last sermon. And it's an opportunity. Will I push them away and pretend I have this all figured out? Or will I go, you're seeing something that I need to grow in? Thank you, I receive that. What's my goal? Looking good or becoming like Jesus? If it's becoming like Jesus, bring on the correction. Just do it kindly graciously, because our egos are fragile. I had to bring you guys into that one. I couldn't just say my ego is fragile. <laughs> Would we be a church that follows Jesus deeply and makes healthy disciples? Let's finish with the quote we started at the beginning. Ultimately, each church will be evaluated by only one thing. <clears throat> it's disciples. Your church is only as good as its disciples. It does not matter how good your praise, preaching, programs, or property are. If your disciples are passive, needy, consumerist, and not moving in the direction of radical obedience, your church is not good. Friends, I wanna be a part of a good church, of a church that Jesus looks at and goes, well done, good and faithful servants. He's not checking out our graphics on Instagram. He's not looking at how well the, 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 the lawn looks. He's not evaluating the song. They go, ooh, they, hit, they missed that chord. He looks at us and goes, are you following me and helping others follow me? Well done. Let's pray. As we sit for just a moment, would you ask Jesus to reveal to you one or two people 
that he's inviting you to become more intentional with. Someone he's probably already put in your life and he's just saying, would you help them come to know me and follow me more faithfully? loving us thank you for calling us to yourself thank you for calling us in community would we evaluate our lives and, and desire to grow so that we can continually invite other people to follow us as we're following perfectly stumbling with sin and yet we repent we walk in the light we say follow me as I follow Jesus thank you for your mercy on us that you're good and kind that you don't wait till we've hit like a perfect level of maturity invite each one of us is filled with your spirit to go out into this great work. The world is hurting and desperately in need of your love and your grace. We partner with you to see people experience that one at a time. We love you. We trust you. It's in your beautiful name.